Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Gather to Grow on tonight at Food from Zanzi, Twitter Spaces. My name is Dawn Numdi, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, Guguleta Matango. Hi, Gugu. Thanks for joining me on the session. Great to have you with me once again. Thank you so much, Dawn. Very excited. I love avocado, so I'm very interested to learn more from our amazing speakers. Of course, yes. I'm a lover of avocados too. And I'm really excited about tonight's space, the green gold, as people call it. I'm going to ask our speakers just to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with your Michael Miller. Michael is from Miller Family Baudry Trust, based in the Tasmanian Municipal District in Limpopo. Welcome, Michael, and so happy to have you with us. You're on Gather to Grow. Tell us a bit about yourself, where you're based. I think I mentioned that now, but also just more about your farming operations. Living is in part of the subtropical area of Zanin. If you look on the, on the Google Maps and so on, it's one of the darker green areas in South Africa. I grew up in the area, similar to Lauren, actually. We grew up in the same vicinity. Well, the, the family set up, as we saw that the Miller Family Boudre Trust has been in the vicinity since 1890s, when the family moved into the area. As farmers, I'm heart and soul into the farming business. Absolutely amazing. So a lot of knowledge to share and lots of learnings over the generations that you're bringing along with you. So thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Welcome, Lauren, to Gather to Grow. Lauren Striever from Emmerin Shirtree Dragon Fruit Estate and Nursery. Hi, Dawn. As Michal said, I'm from the same vicinity in the Pilitsi Valley. My grandfather started on the farm and there were some avocado trees already growing. And then it was my father who pursued it commercially. So I'm third generation and my children are fourth generation on our farm. We've got some very old avo trees and we've also got some very young avo trees. So it's something that we continue to be excited about and continue to invest in. And we've also got an avocado nursery, Amarantia avocado nursery. So we're very passionate about producing not only the fruit, but also the trees. Thank you so much for joining us here once again, Lauren. It's great to have you with us. And then, of course, we have Stephen Marto. He is from the South African Avocado Growers Association. And he is their transformation coordinator. Welcome, Stephen. It's great to have you with us. And it's so great to have a representative body speaking on the topic here on Gather to Grow tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Just a background, I'm an agricultural economist. I'm from the Polokwane side of Limpopo. I've been dealing a lot with a lot of emerging growers, upcoming growers, both black and white. And I've been dealing a lot about with subtropical commodities. So just that my background. Thank you so much for joining us and also just sharing your expertise and all of your expertise specifically dealing with smaller new farmers to the space. And a lot of people wish to diversify and maybe want to do it on a smaller scale and not go full force from day one. So I think it's really interesting to have you here and also have you share some of your experience with other farmers in the sector as well. We're going to get straight into it, Guru. I'm going to go with the first question just to talk about, you know, the fact that South Africa is a major producer and exporter of avocados in the world. What does the landscape look like for Mzanzi's farmers when it comes to growing avocado? Shall we start with the agricultural economist to take that one and someone from the South African Avocado Growers Association just to give us a bit of an overview or a bird's eye view of what the industry actually looks like? In the past three to four years, we've seen an increase in, a decimal increase in the avocado production in South Africa. What is happening is that we've seen a lot of farmers planting new trees. We've seen a lot of farmers uh, trying to introduce new technologies which are good for production and which are sustainable and good for the environment as well, uh, which include water, which include the vicinity around where the farmers are working. So what we've seen in that is that We've seen a decimal increase over those years of at least 60 tons per year, which is an average 60 tons per year of avocado being produced for export, which is around 45% of the total production in South Africa. And again, what we have seen, we've seen an increase of at least 5 to 7% of the plantation or new plantation. And what we've seen again is that the number of the fruits which go through to retail production or the retail supply in South Africa, which is the domestic retail or formal market, has been increasing. And again, we have seen even number of informal traders as well showing an increase and a decimal increase as well. But what we've seen is that in terms of processing, which is you'll realize that our main processing in South Africa is oil and guacamole. So we've seen that the years don't go as balanced as like with export or the domestic supply. With the production of guacamole and oil, it depends annually on number of fruits which cannot make it to the export or the, to the local market. So when farmers increase their production, they increase their technology, they increase their productivity. 
sometimes you may find that there is a suffering, there's a little bit suffering when we're looking into the production of oil and guacamole because more of is that the foods which cannot make the, it to the market or to those formal markets which have highlighted above end up in the processing facilities and that's where you find less and less and less as much as production and quality is increasing. So over the years, what we've seen is that number of trees has grown, a lot of farmers have focused on quality and a lot of farmers have focused on the increase in productivity and uh, making uh, more money or more meaningful out of this production. Wow, sounds absolutely great, Ethan. Thank you so much for that. And it does seem that, you know, South Africa is doing well when it comes to the avocado industry. Well, now my next question is that how long does it take for an avocado tree to bear fruit in South Africa? And most importantly, where can one get avocado trees? You know, because I know you're gardening, you use the seed and you wait for the roots to sprout. But if you want to be a farmer and you want to go commercial, where do you source these trees as well to plant? Michael, you'd like to take this one? Well, actually, the avocado tree is quite fast to produce, to come into production. Obviously, production can be one fruit, isn't it? <laughs> as you mentioned, as a gardener, one could plant the seed. And then the seeds, every seed from every avocado will be of different genetic composition, which ends up, as a gardener, I'll, I'll be disappointed because the one I plant and eat from will not be the same as the one I actually acquired on the shelf. So for that reason, it's, if I go into commercial production, it'll be important to acquire the actual vegetative material or the trees from a commercial farmer's nursery that can ascertain that this, these trees that I acquired is of the cultivar that I'm acquiring, that I wanted to plant. So once, obviously, there are quite a variety of cultivars that's, that's available, cultivar being, being the type of fruit, isn't it? So once I acquire the fruit tree, it's already more or less one year old. It is weaned. <laughs> and I, when I, once planting, I can expect that by the next year of the same period, Within 12 months, in other words, the next flowering season, this little tree might push its first little flowers. And of those, there might be the first setting of fruit. In other words, the year after that, we'll have the first one or two or three, maybe five fruits on that tree. Obviously, depending on the different cultivars, some are much more reproductive than other ones. But that gives an idea. More or less two years before the first minute crop will be on the tree. Thanks so much for the overview. And maybe Lauren, she just mentioned now that she is obviously a nursery that supplies these trees to farmers who want to start out. What do they cost more or less if you want to buy trees from, say, your, your, your nursery or others who produce the trees as well, or grow the trees to sell to farmers? Thanks, Dawn. Yeah, that's a great, and it can depend on, on a variety of aspects. To give you an idea from our nursery, um, our abo trees cost 135 rand per tree, and that would be to a commercial grower. We use seedling rootstock. So as Michal explained, if you took a seed from your garden and sprouted it, yes, you might grow a tree and yes, it might produce the odd fruit, but it wouldn't necessarily be true to type of the cultivar that you acquired that seed from. So if you go into the supermarket and you buy hass and you take the hass seed and you sprout it and it grows, you're not going to pick a hass. You're going to pick an unknown genetic. So what we do is have to graft the cultivar onto the rootstock to determine or to create the required and the desired cultivar. So that is the method that we use in our nursery. And other nurseries also produce what they call a clonal rootstock, which is a more complicated process. And they do charge a different price. There's a different price set for a clonal rootstock, which is then also grafted to the cultivar. I can't actually give you a good idea of prices. But as Michal mentioned, it's always important to source your trees from a commercial nursery that has the experience and the know-how. There's a lot of protocols that go into the sanitary environments and sourcing the correct cultivars, the correct plant material that you actually end up with a superior tree. It's an easy thing to produce, especially on mass, which is why it's important to source your trees from a commercial nursery. The production of avocados is concentrated mainly in humid subtropical areas of Limpopo, Mpumalanga and parts of KZN. Why is this the right climate for these trees? Maybe any of the speakers just unmute your mic and tell us why this is important and why it's grown in these regions. Well, Dawn, what's interesting is that of late, growers have been pushing the boundaries a little bit in what would be considered the traditional growing areas. And yes, typically subtropical and humid areas. But if you have a look at some of the expanse that's taken place in the industry, you'll see that trees are being grown in the Mohobus Kloof region, for example, where you know, you're pushing the boundary in terms of quite a lot cooler temperatures, even the Western Cape, which has quite a different climate to what we're used to up here. 
traditionally part of the appeal of the humidity is to help with heat stress and you know that high rainfall in the time where you can avoid heat stress and also to ensure good flower sets but with modern farming practices and very technical and very specific irrigation sort of philosophies and inputs one can really use water management to ensure that you get a good crop set even in a more marginal area so it's actually expanded and developed quite a lot which is interesting Stephen wanted to unmute his mic to also contribute to that. There's what commonly people call it the green belt. If you look into the vendor area in Limpopo area, going down through the Tanin Mugetsi Tanini area, and going down through again the Mpumalanga. If you check in the Mpumalanga, in the area of Nelspreit, White River Nelspreit, going down again into the KZN. And currently uh, going down down the Eastern Cape and a little bit of the Cape, that is where you find the greener belt, which a lot of farmers are referring to as. So there's a lot of rainfall on this region. The soil is very good. That's why it's considered the subtropical area. That is where a lot of avocado is grown and it becomes commercial. But then there are a number of things which must be considered when you're planting avocado in this region. The first one, you must consider that the area, even if it has frost, the frost must not be what we call a black frost. Look, because a black frost delay the production of the tree. In winter, it becomes extremely cold. And how do you determine that it becomes extremely cold? It's when you check your water pipes, your normal water pipes, freeze so that the water cannot flow. You know that you have a black frost in the area. So the place with that black frost doesn't or you cannot grow avocado from uh, the area. Secondly, you must check the soil type. If your soil is sandy, the plant cannot survive. I know there's a lot of technology which is being introduced, but a lot of farmers are not producing enough quality, enough quantity through this sandy soil uh, production because it delays the production and the soil becomes more hot in winter. And one of the things which avocado doesn't want is that the soil must not become hot in the summer time. And again, one thing which we must consider is the rainfall pattern. If you know that your rainfall is delaying, your soil doesn't keep enough water or quantity, and you find that you don't have enough water resources around you. Avocado is something not to plant or not to consider as planting because those are a number of things which are needed. And those we find a lot of time in the subtropical regions of your Limpopo going to Mpumalanga, KZ and Eastern Cape and some part of the Eastern Cape and down in the Western Cape and some part of the Western Cape. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that. Uh, Michael, would you like to add something before I move on to my next question? I wanted to push the boundaries, as my fellow industrialists want to refer to. You know, we learn from various cultures that there's, there's an expression that says, if there's a will, there's a way, basically. But one of the examples that we, in this direction is what we find in Israel. You know, Israel is, is quite an arid area and they're quite water stressed. And they are one of the leading technologically advanced avocado farming industries or zones in the world. I mentioned that because it breaks our, our barriers of saying that certain areas are certain, are certain producing cultivating areas. Another example of this is not too long ago, a zone close to us in the northern parts of Mpumalanga, where the people were traditionally producing tobacco. The area is close to Orechstadt, I think that used to be the name. And it's settled in a valley and if you drive through the same valley now, you'll find that they are producing soft citrus and vegetables, and even some avocados and macadamia nuts. So as Stephen was mentioning, if you carefully dissect, evaluate the different climatic factors in certain areas, you can, might find that avocados can be produced. As long as Stephen also mentioned, there's not a serious frost. The heat you can manage with soil coverages, what they call mulches, and with careful moisture management. Obviously, the, the presupposition is that there is some moisture around to manage. So, are we saying that basically the avocado cultivars that we produce commercially here in South Africa is sensitive to like water stress? I know we mentioned the Danin. Is it a suitable area to grow avocado? It also is a very dry area. What happens then when it comes to growing avocados? And, you know, as a farmer, do you need to now think about irrigation more specifically if you're growing it in Danin? The majority of the area is fairly well irrigated naturally. The rainfall varying between 800 millimeters up to 1,600 millimeters per annum. Ample amount of water that comes down as long as one can capture them. 
why I wanted to expand, extend the limitations of zones. In the recent times, there's been in the southern section of Africa vast areas that has been producing avocados also. Sections of Namibia and Zambia and Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Angola and Tanzania and sections of Kenya and areas in Egypt even. It re-emphasizes the point that if there's water available to irrigate with, and I think Stephen also mentioned, it's important that it's good quality water, saying that's a bit too high in mineral content, then it's possible to produce avocados. The two most important factors is the intense cold, in other words, lower than four, five, six degrees Celsius, and then without water, no water availability to irrigate with. If there's soil, arable soil, in other words, loosening soil, that's not only the rock, obviously, then avocados could be produced successfully. Thank you so much for that. Well, how does it work in terms of producing the fruit? How long does it take for an avocado tree to produce fruit? And then also, do you need like a male and female tree? What should the layout be like when you're planting a number of trees on your farm? Lauren, maybe you can come in here or Stephen? No, you don't need um, a male and female. Um, the avocado tree will naturally pollinate. There are certain conditions that need to be favorable for pollination to take place. It's important to have enough bees. If it rains continuously during pollination, you run the risk of not setting your crop, something that happened to us the year before last. And just in terms of time frame and production, it does depend on the cultivar. As Michal said, you might get one or two fruits on your trees in the first two to three years. Roughly speaking, if you're looking at a cash flow, you will start to see a return on your investment in about year six. Thanks so much, Lauren. If we talk about the use of fertilizer, we know that farmers are really feeling the price of fertilizer at the moment. What fertilizer is best used for avocado trees? I see, Stephen, you unmuted your mic. Would you like to maybe answer that I also asked? Okay, yeah. Uh, Lauren has missed uh, the, the question, the next question, the lifespan of an avocado tree. Like we have Lauren here. I went to Lauren's farm. The father showed me a tree which is 100 years and it's still bearing fruit. So in as much as we're talking about the lifespan, there are trees which are old as 1960 and they've been producing quality crop even in the current period. So what is happening is that when you take good care of your trees, they will continue bearing fruit. And that includes the post-harvest management of mulching, of pruning your trees, of making sure you provide enough fertilizers and making sure that you irrigate enough so they can live for a longer period. That's amazing to think that there was trees that are 100 years old and are still bearing fruit. And then in terms of fertilizer cost, anyone want to maybe respond to that question around fertilizer? If I could add there, the most important factor is, and more and more industrial research is, is pointing to that, that if you can keep the soil and its inhabitants healthy, then your tree should be happy. And the inhabitants are obviously various types of microorganisms living in the soil. And they actually have interactive role, symbiotic role. You know, They are feeding from the excretions from the roots of the tree, and then they're providing accessible nutrients to the plant. It's an amazing study. Now, excessive chemical fertilizers, fortunately, it's becoming too expensive nowadays, actually kills down that fine balance of life inside the soil. If you can revive them, it's, it's not quite too difficult to revive. Then they should actually help your tree to recover. Now, what we've been dealing with is applying different types of extracts from organic materials like guanos and manures, cattle and or, or sheep or horse manure. There's an excretion of that animals. And then apply that to the soil that feeds not only the microbes, but it also has sufficient nutrients for the plant itself to operate. In. Something important I left out is the point of calcium. Calcium is very important as with humans. So it's, and for that reason, and it's also not too expensive. For that reason, it adds up to about 4,000 to 5,000 rands per hectare. That includes the analysis, the research in seeing what, what is actually contained in the soil, as well as the applying of the fertilizer. Thank you so much, Michael, for that. I'd just like to maybe touch on, you know, ever seems too good to be true in terms of, you know, crops to plants and, you know, the amount of things that one comes with it. I just wanted to touch on the challenges, right? So I recently actually just watched this documentary on Netflix called Rotten, and it was speaking about the agricultural trade, because we all know that, you know, Mexico, I think, is, is basically one of the largest producers of avocado. What about, you know, people saying to us, avocado farmers that don't plant avocados, they cause, you know, deforestation, they are water guzzlers. The fact that also they require a lot of uh, pesticides. So what would be the methods to combat that? And what do we say to that? I think what you're talking about is something that the entire globe needs to be conscious about in all fields of agriculture. 
why I liked Michal's answer about the soil health so much because farmers in general need to have a shift in their outlook and their approach to fertilizing and to pest control. Ultimately, at the end of the day, for us to survive and for it to continue to be sustainable, we have to consider sustainable approaches, which means biological control of pests, of diseases. And that's where the industry bodies like Saga, for example, with the the avocados, play such an important role in helping to do that research, helping to bring new solutions. But I think that's a global issue that needs to be considered very strongly. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm having trouble growing my avocado. Hey, Adam, thanks so much for asking your question. Do you have specific issues that you want to maybe bring up or just like some generally you having trouble growing avocado? Maybe just the yeah, more specific yeah. question for people to respond to? I have my avocado by my window and it's been going for around uh, three years, but but it hasn't sprouted. I wanted just to clarify, if, if you're saying it hasn't sprouted, do you mean it's flowered? Yeah, no, it, it's still soil. I guess we're not getting enough information on what is happening, but... Maybe you try to put the avocado pit, I'm assuming, into the ground and maybe nothing happens. So this is on a much smaller household, trying it out scale. Maybe we can just speak broadly about this growing from seed or how does it work? And then maybe just to advise that it's better to buy a tree instead of, you know, just growing it from the pit. Adam, we'll, we'll maybe ask you to just to clarify your question and maybe be more clear about what you're asking. I'm going to give Nabil a chance. Nabil, you are, have the floor and you have the mic. There's um, something I really need to talk about uh, in terms of my avocado. So I've actually uh, started a, um, a root plantation for about like three months. <laughs> my avocados, they, they can't stop growing. You're complaining about the fact that they can't stop growing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now that's a very problem to have. <laughs> but maybe our speakers does have an opinion man, about man, it. Man, you need to give me some of those. <laughs> give me avocado. Monday, you want to maybe ask a question? I would like to know how many uh, square meters, how many avocados can somebody grow on a 5,000 square meters? If it's not stopping growing, then uh, the avocado tree is good. The first 12 months, it's good to get volume in your tree. Normally in our season, the springtime, late winter, early spring is a flowering season. So about three months before that, it's good to cut down on the nitrogen applications. Anything that has nitrogen or amino acids or proteins will stimulate foliar growth. In other words, your tree will not then flower, but rather push leaves still. So if you can cut back on the nitrogen, then it'll by spring be pushing flowers. And then obviously you'll have some fruit the other year. Now on 5,000 square meters, it's more or less half a hectare. On a hectare, you can plant roughly between, depending on the size of the tree that you would like. Obviously you don't want the tree too high. So you will be cutting back on the upward growth, simulating sideward growth. The least you can plant, it will depend on you, but the most you can plant is probably around industrial-wise. If you plant the trees two meters from each other in square patterns, two by two in other words, you'll end up with around 800 to 1,000 trees. But then you'll have end up with a very intense pruning regime, keeping the trees not too high, not too wide. There's been many accounts of this being done successfully. And then it's easy to spray, easy to harvest, easy to prune, and you'll have... The whole tree is accessible to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for contributing. I have a few more questions here. You know that international and national demand for this crop, people really want it. It's really increased. People expect it to be available year-round. What is the market like? Maybe our speakers can just talk a bit about that. And I see we have Disney Baker also wanting to ask questions. Maybe just speak about marketing. Hi. Yeah, I was saying before we go into other questions, can we go into understanding the market? So to understand the traditional avocado production in South Africa, you must understand the season first. So our season moves in as much as from February until October. But we've seen an increase in number of product which cultivars which can grow into from the November, December and January. But they're not making that much difference in terms of the quantity which we produce in South Africa. So the production will start with the areas which are in the Oma area, like your vendor area and the pit of Tanini area. That's where you'll see the first green skin of Fiote growing. Then it will be followed again by areas which are a little bit cooler than the vendor area. That's where you'll see the Fiote coming in. And later we will start harvesting the has a commodity. And when we harvest the has commodity, then immediately after that, then we'll start seeing other commodities such as Ryan coming into place. And that is why it moves all year round until we, we arrive in October and others moving in between November and January the next year. So what is happening in the market is that there are a number of things which are happening. 
We've seen the export market increasing, as I explained earlier. And then we have seen again the increase in the direct sale of retail to the local retailers. And we've seen an increase in local informal sector. A little bit of stagnance on processing because of the factors I've explained earlier. But we have an increase. And the outlook is that over the five to seven years, we might see a bigger increase in avocado export in South Africa. Because why? Over the past three years, we have seen number of farmers planting thousands and thousands of trees, increasing their productivity, increasing their production. So over the next five to seven years, that's where we'll start seeing the full production of the trees. And that will show us that the market is going in the right direction and the growth of fruits and the quantity of fruits is growing into the right direction. So that's where we'll see that. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Denise, for that. I think what's really exciting for farmers, you know, and avocado enthusiasts like myself is knowing the yield. So could you guys maybe just tell us how much fruit one can expect from a tree that also how old? And maybe just give us the numbers around that so we can estimate how much yield one can get. And also how, how big of a space do you need to plant one avocado tree? I don't think we also touched on that. Yeah, I think some of the things Michelle has cited on, but I will take a few things based on that. The spacing, when Michael talks about two meter to two meter, that is what we call the high density plantation. But for new comers, we don't expect them to do the high density production because high density production requires a lot of care. The care of number one, pruning will be difficult. Cleaning the orchard will be difficult. It will be expensive to manage. We have industrial norm, which we give to new entrants of planting at at least 7 by 3 to 3.5 or 8 by 4. Why this? It will help you in terms of management. But you must know that immediately you increase the size of your spacing, then you will have less and less tree. Because in one hectare, if you were to plant, for example, for 8 by 4, you'll have around 312 trees. But then the growth will be good and you'll be able to manage your trees unlike when you do what we call high-density production of planting around 800. But it is still acceptable, as long as you know that you can take charge of managing your own trees or your own orchards. And again, it depends from farm to farm on quantity or the number of tons which is harvested. It depends on the size of the tree. It depends on the growth of the tree. It depends on the quantity of fertilizers which you put on the tree. That is very much important. And I guess when you take good care of your trees, that's when you will put harvest of your tree and then how you take care of your tree. Thanks so much. What are the other options and what else can you do with avocados besides pressing for oil? And what other byproducts are there? The industry focuses mostly on the export market. It takes normally the most most beautiful fruit exteriorly, eh? And those are sent to the export market. Why? Because the income per kg will be better normally if the market is not over full and so on. When deciding where to send your your fruit, you can either send it fresh, like in boxes or in bags, and those will be sold fresh to the the end consumer. And then the other section in line will be the the industrial fruit that will go into guacamole or oil. Nowadays, there are some channels for industrial fruit also for the export market. And when considering where to send our third grade or industrial fruit, depends on if the industrial export market is available. If it's available, everything goes there because the income to the farm will be better to cover the costs on the farm. The small scale of farmer, if you're just starting up and you've planted your 100 or 200 trees and you hired your first harvest, the best will be to start harvesting you know, and see how the avocado actually conveys itself, how it conducts itself. Give some to friends, let them try it out, put the summon bags, sell it next to the road or send it to the the local municipal markets. Those will be places where big or smaller scale fresh outlets, vegetable shops will go to acquire produce for their shops. So those will used to be the general outlet to the producer. Nowadays, the the big retailers, the fresh marks, which are the checkers, the shop rights or the pick and pays and the spars and so on. Those nowadays form distribution centers, which then acquires towards the central space from there where they will be distributing. Those are just a few concepts about marketing. Obviously, there are marketing agencies. You can send through them, but then they take a small cut, obviously, for the the logistical services and the admins and so on. 
But those are normally easier ways through which to, to channel your marketing because they are in touch with the open market. Thank you so much, Michael. I just wanted to speak about just the harvesting of an avocado seed. I think we did mention that plants grown from seeds will be obviously like six years because from grafting, it would, if you buy it from the nursery, it's going to be already a year old. When is it ready to be harvested? And just also the, the post-harvest storage. Maybe we can touch on that, Stephen or Lauren? Look, like Michal said, you could get a harvest in the first two to three years, a small harvest. But when you're talking about heading towards full production, you know, and what the tree is eventually capable of producing maximum quantity, then yes, you're looking at around six years plus, if that answers the question. Thank you so much, Lauren. Michael, you wanted to add? When the fruit then actually is hanging on the tree, normally a few indicators. Firstly, it changes from a shiny appearance to a dull appearance. Then it's good to harvest the first one that turns dull and put it on your window shelf in the kitchen, and then see if it ripens. If it ripens, you cut it open, test it. If it tastes accessible, that's normally fine. There's also a more technical way of testing. You actually grate the pulp of the fruit, and you measure more or less 10 or 20 or 30 grams, and then you heat it up bit by bit, causing the moisture content in the grated pulp to evaporate. And when it stops losing weight, after all the moisture is evaporated, then the regime is that if there's less than 80% moisture, then your fruit is ready to harvest. Then from harvesting, it, the shelf life is more or less five to seven days under room temperature. And many, many consumers will say, but not, my fruit, I want to ripen it quickly. When it's, there's an easy way, cover it in a blanket, not a plastic bag because the plastic bag becomes too moist. It causes fungal infection. And a paper bag, old people spoke about the newspaper method. Then you actually capture the, the ripening hormone, the ethylene. And then it should ripen in about four to five days instead of seven days. Some cultivars can lie on the shelf for up to two and a half weeks, especially what I call the Pinkerton varieties, or related varieties. And then sometimes consumers get agitated because this thing is mine is not ripening. But just be patient. Obviously, after harvesting as a commercial farmer, a small commercial farmer, it's important to either get it as soon as possible to a commercial packhouse where you can cool the fruit to around six to seven degrees Celsius. Otherwise, once cut off from the mother plant, the fruit will start the ripening process faster than sitting on, on the plant. You need to stop that process as soon as possible in order to have a longer time period to pack and to allow it to be distributed without ripening in the process. Thanks so much for that clarity. I think we have two more speakers that just want to say something. Um, I just wanted to give them each like one minute to speak. So Billy, I'm going to give you the floor. You can grab the mic. I'm just going to comment on, on the market issues. There was a speaker earlier who mentioned something about South Africans like producing like avocados to a larger scale, and that is pushed by the market. That is the demand of it globally. Like what is happening now, there is a, a lot of demand, as I think the producers rightly mentioned that a lot of avocados are needed in the global space. And part of what is pushing South Africa to be export-oriented like to the large extent, it is the quantity and as well as the quality that the country is producing. Now, because in South Africa, we're not, we're not processing a lot of it. But if you are to look into the global space, there's a lot that is happening. You know, we have now like your yogurts that are containing your avocados. You have non-dairy yogurt bites. You have some, a lot of stuff that needs avocado. It is similar to now to palm oil. And also now from the key producing areas or countries, there's a competition for palm oil. If you compare to countries like Indonesia, for an example, Indonesia is one of the key producers in the world. There is an issue of production competition there. So what is going to be important for the producers now going to the next five, seven years, it is going to be the competition for the quality of the product. So for those guys that are entering it, I think it's going to be important because the export market that South Africa exports to, the market there it is very tight in terms of the quality. So the, the guys that are into that, they have to make sure that the quality that they are producing, it is going to be top notch because domestically, we are seeing also prices are being too nice, which is good, but comes the next few years, that may change because of the quantity of that is getting into the market. So I just wanted to say that otherwise I could say a lot based on time. I don't even have time. Thanks, John, for that. Thanks so much, Tabile. And then Hafiz, you can also take the floor. With regards to the quantity or no, the quality, you would also need a suitable land to do your cultivation. So I want to ask what type of land is best for the cultivation of the uh, avocado? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, would you maybe like to take this one? First one, just to highlight on the issue of the market. Uh, if we check at the markets, why are we much export oriented? Looking to statistics is that over the past 20 years, 1991, we were at least exporting 32 tons. 2001, we were at least exporting around 34 tons. 
And if we go to 2011, we were exactly in 2011, we were having what we call a off market. So we, we exported less. But if we go back into 2010, we have exported 47 tons. And currently in 2021, we have exported at least 60 tons. So it shows that the demand internationally is growing each and every day and it's going well. But for issue of demand and supply, we again check at the issue of price. If the price goes up, that's where we find a lot of a competition where a lot of people are trying to come in. And South Africa, because of its a good quantity, its good quality, it's able to compete for better prices internationally. So for South Africa, the processing market of oil, guacamole, detergents, and other things, it's less priced at a region of at least 80% less than the first price of exporting the product. So that is why we're focusing a lot on that. Again, we did talk about the good conditions of producing avocado, and we said that it's in the subtropical area. In subtropical area, that's where we find good rainfall, good sunlight, find a lot of good soil, which is either 30% of clay content, which we find in the soil. A lot of time, it will, it will be called bloom soil. And finally, you have to have the area which is not extremely cold. And when we say extremely cold, we are talking about a point where you, you are not producing at a, what we call the black frost. Black frost means that it can go to a negative 10 or more. Thanks so much for that. Maybe I'd just like to ask our speakers one final tip for new farmers looking to diversify or explore into farming with avocados just as we end off. A good tip is to find a friend, make a friend that's avocado farming presently, and then he or she can guide you through some very valuable arable land because they will give you many tips because they will be your friends and walk beside you. Thanks so much, Michael. Stephen, your, your last comment? Thank you very much, Michael, on that one. In 2020, when COVID-19 started, I introduced to Michael a grower uh, who just started planting the trees in that year, 2020. And he has been mentoring that farmer up to now. This year, we have went to Michael's farm with the good product from the farmer. The product are now moved from Zanini to uh, the Cape Town market. That means the farmer has done extremely well in as far as from the time I introduced him to Michael to now where he is able to supply his product to the Cape Town market. So what is happening is that farmers must find people who are going to mentor them. They must contact the industry in South Africa. We have South African Avocado Growers Association. That's where I'm based uh, on a daily basis. So they can contact people like us. We've done a lot of research, a lot of technical expertise on this. And if they contact us, we will be able to assist them. And finally, farmers take farming serious. And when I say they must take farming serious, I mean that they must not make it as just to be in farming because there's opportunity in farming, but they must know that they are farming because they want to make means out of farming and they want to make employment and be employed under that. Thank you so much. There you have it, guys. There's a lot of support for the South African Avocados of Growers Association. And thank you so much to our speakers. Kuku, thank you so much for being an awesome co-host. It's always great sharing the space with you. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope that you learned as much as I did. Thanks, Kuku. Thank you so much, Dawn. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye for now.